And he told her, he was like, just tell the truth. Just tell the truth. And the truth sometimes is is the ugly along with the pretty. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. That's what life is, man. It's, it's pretty, it's ugly, it's bumpy. But at the end of it, if you can live with it and your truth and you're honest with yourself, no matter all the ugly shit you had to go through, then, you know, it's sometimes just worth it. You're listening to the New York Said Podcast. Fear not, my friends. This will be my greatest performance. What's up, brother? What up? How's everything? I'm good, man. How you doing? I'm well. No complaints. First off, I just want to say congratulations on making and finishing this film. Nobody was here. The life of TMNK. Thank you. Some people like start a film and they never get a chance to finish it. Can you talk about just out the gate? We're just going to jump right in. Can you talk about some of the challenges that you've had to overcome in completing your film? Yeah, I mean, a uh, film is something that um, is difficult to do. And, you know, me as an independent filmmaker with not the funds to really do it, you just have to make a way. So there's limited funds, limited resources, limited personnel. At the end of the day, really, like I said, it, it was just me. And then sometimes when you are an indie filmmaker and you're not funded, it's just you trying to do it and whatever other money you're bringing in and the time that you're trying to put it together may be derailed because you're working, trying to just live life and survive and pay rent and or mortgage or whatever it is and family and all of those things that come into play when you're trying to make a film. As a filmmaker, when it's not paying you anything or you know you don't have a budget for it but the the great thing about it now is with technology the way it is now you can do it yourself with limited resources so now you just have to find the time and the will to do it i think a lot of people don't make the time because they're doing so many other things but that's that's what you got to do it that's that's what people call a grind you tired doesn't matter grind it out right 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 you don't have money for it find a workaround Sometimes that takes it, it makes it a little bit longer than I guess if you were backed because you are independent making this film, you have to find a way. So sometimes the way is just time where it's just like the right people show up, the right situation shows up, the money shows up. But when it doesn't, what happens? Right. And that's when people get discouraged and like, oh, this isn't going for me. This, uh, you know, it's not going right. It's just taking too long and people get discouraged. And that's why people don't finish, finish films. Or finish whatever project, right? Uh, because they get discouraged because of the time that it takes. But um, I've made a vow to myself, and and uh, I made a vow to TM and K that I was going to finish this movie, and and I did it, and that's what I did. Luckily, I do have a background somewhat in film, so uh, and I do know how to edit. You know, you have to work it to a certain point where other people take you serious. You know, yeah. um, I'm the type of person who. I've worked at different networks. I've worked at BT. I've worked at record labels. So I've always had people come up to me and be like, I got this idea. Or I'm thinking about doing a song. But yet it's just an idea in their head. And mm-hmm. they haven't produced anything to be like, oh, okay, I'm on board or put any sweat equity into it. So if you do it enough and you put enough sweat equity into it, you'll get other people who believe in the project because they'll see what you've done on your own. And they're like, all right, cool. Nobody's going to give you their time right? if you haven't spent the time on it. So wait, before we move forward, like, because we say things like sweat equity, like what does that mean to you? Or what does, because I mean, like, I know what sweat equity is, but right. I kind of want to unpack what sweat equity sure. means. Sure, that's actually going out and doing it yourself. That means you taking the time physically and putting it out i mean the term comes from you out there working and breaking a sweat <laughs> an actual so that, sweat from doing the work yeah. <laughs> not, <laughs> not sitting around going you know what i want to do yeah one right. day i'm gonna do that and you just become exactly. this i'm gonna do like i'm gonna do i'm gonna, and then you I'm never, do and then you never do it yeah or they just said like nobody gives me a chance right ain't nobody giving me no chance i'm like no fuck you, you gotta do it yourself yeah you gotta and, give yourself the first chance like there's that that statement of like, if you're putting your thumb out waiting for someone to stop for you to help you push your car, but if you, no one's, it's going to be rare that somebody's going to stop. But if you just start pushing your car, somebody will pull over and be like, let me help you push the car because they see you pushing your car as opposed to you standing in front of it with your thumb out. 
and breaking a sweat. Yeah. <laughs> but then that sweat equity, <laughs> <laughs> literally, quite yeah. literally breaking a sweat. So, yeah. you know, the sweat equity thing, it can, it's, it's, it, well, in, in some industries, it's, uh, figurative, but in some industries it's literal. Right. Uh, if you're playing sports or doing stuff, well, you know, whatever manual labor you have to do, but you know, literally, um, in the terms of film, you know, it was me, a camera and a mic and going out and filming people. Did you have like switch up several cameras over time where you're like, or did you use the same camera throughout? So I, so again, this where that sweat equity comes into play. So, it was me at first filming people and miking them and trying to make sure the lighting's right and then trying to do the interview, which is very difficult because you're trying to make sure it's in frame and it's in focus and, and the sound correctly. is right. Yep. Yeah, exactly. And you're trying to do the interview. So again, as I went along and did all these interviews myself uh, and show people that I'm actually doing it, I was able to luckily get a couple people to help me with some filming because you know, trying to concentrate on questions and what I need to do and, and trying to concentrate on the technical aspect is very difficult. You know, fortunately, I was able to do it with some of them because a lot of the interviews you see in the movie, just me, a mic, and, and, the, and the person that yeah. I'm interviewing. Yeah. But then, you know, by the time I started doing stuff in New York, that's when I was able to level up. And again, it comes into play where... I talked, you know, somebody saw that I had already done this and they offered their services to help me out because they knew TMK, they knew nobody, and they thought what I was doing uh, was uh, worth their time. So, you know, that's why, you know, in New York, I did have, you know, one person helping me with lighting and, and cameras and things like that. So it progressed from there. Before we like really just geek out on the on the technical aspects of filmmaking, because right, it's right. so easy for someone like you and I to just go right there. I want folks to like truly understand, you know, who TMNK was and how you met and what inspired you to even make a film about the me nobody knows. Yeah, TMNK, um, nobody, the me nobody knows. Um, actually, my, my children met him first before I met them. They were probably like five and seven years old. And they were out with my wife at the time. And then they came home and they were like, Daddy, we met nobody. We met nobody. And I was like, what are y'all talking about? Y'all met nobody. And this was in Florida? This was in Miami, yeah. Okay. Uh, this is probably 09. Okay. Before he moved, he was still at the time living in New York, but he was here for Art Basel. Um, and so they had met him out at some event and, you know, they told me all about him. My, my wife was like, nah, he's a street artist. That's his name. His name is nobody. I was like, oh, okay. That makes sense. So they went on. So nobody left a big impression on my kids. And so I think a year later I had met him at another event and I was like, oh, okay. You're, you're the cat. This is the, the cat that my kids been talking about. This is nobody. So we started talking. So right off the bat, you know, with him, he's super outgoing to talk about his work, you know, he's just, just bigger than like personality, which for me, I understood right off the bat as this dude is just putting his stuff out there, marketing his work, mm. which to be honest with you, I was super happy because a lot of some artists can't form two words about their artwork. Right. Uh, this guy wouldn't shut up about his artwork. <laughs> 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 but that's what you have to do. Yeah, respectfully, respectfully. No, I know, I know. But that's yeah. what you have to do. You know, he was put it in that sweat equity that we talked about. Yeah. You know, it's, it's one thing to make the painting. It's another thing to sell it. Mm. So, um, you know, we vibed, we vibed a little bit on that. And uh, we took a couple pictures. And then maybe six or seven weeks later... I was driving my car and my daughter was like, daddy, daddy, that's nobody skating a skateboard. I was like, nah, nah, nobody don't live over here. Cause he had lived in an area called Wynwood in Miami. Mm -hmm. And I knew he had lived over there. So back when Wynwood was like the hood. When Wynwood was the hood. Yeah. When it was just a submerging area where there were a lot of different artists uh, that came to this little space and converged and created and made art. Which kind of uh, reflects Bushwick, Brooklyn. And uh, it has, Winwood's its own thing in Bushwick, but they do have similar upbringings. Absolutely. And there's okay. there's places across the country as well. Yeah. You know, Austin, Texas, you know, that have gone through that whole transformation mm -hmm. where once it was this, you know, boho chic place. And now, 
you know, the developers come and they take over. But I, I don't I don't know as much as they take over as that. That's the plan all along. And they, you know, let all these artists run around and do this thing and make it a cool spot. Right. Um, but anyway, he 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 was my, my daughter was like, he's skateboarding. That's him. And I was like, no, nah, that's not him. And then I think later that day I walked down the street because he lived like four or five blocks from him from me. And he was in the studio. I was like, and I went home and told my daughter, and she was like, "I told you that was nobody." Wow. So, so I connected with him more because he moved closer to my house. And by that time, his demeanor was a little different. He wasn't as big and outgoing. Um, he was just working. And I remember it was during the first the Republican National Convention where Trump was then running for the nomination uh for a republican uh for the republican nomination so he was doing artwork about everything that was going on at that particular time uh there was the charlotte mass shooting as well so there was a lot of stuff going on black lives matter there's a lot of stuff that was going on during that time he was coming up with an incredible body of work and i was like man this is great when are you gonna when are you gonna show this and he was he was just like, I don't want to do that anymore. I've done that. I've been around the world. I don't want to do that anymore. I just want to. Sh- I just want to work. That's it. That's all I want to do. Is work, work. I just want to produce art. That's it. I've done all these shows. I've done it. I just want to produce. And I was just like, okay, all right, well, cool. So, well, people need to see this. You know, let me just come and document it. You know, because that's that's my background. I, you know, I shoot and create content. So I came with my little camera and was shooting him and then we'll come back the next day. And then he saw that I was serious. Um, so he started opening up a little bit more to me. Mm. He was going in and out of the depression. I would see him like, I mean, literally like breaking down, crying. And um, then the next day he'd be totally fine. So I just thought he was like in a little rut. You know, he's in a little rut. We're going to film this. And then when he's better and gets all his art out, his artwork out and all his ideas out, you know, we'll be in Paris showing the film, the short film on the work that he was doing. And that would be that. But unfortunately, you know, that that didn't happen. He, um, you know, depression got the best of him, unfortunately. And um, I, the last time I saw him, he... He was complaining about not seeing his girlfriend. He was dating this girl in Germany. And um, he was like, I just got to go see my girl. I just got to see my girl. And I was like, okay, well, cool. Um, and I actually curated a show for him because I kept telling him he needed to show his work. He said, okay, you keep telling me I need to show it, you do it. And I was like, okay, I never curated an art show before, but I'll do it. Um, so I curated the space and um, it was a it was a pretty good show, but he wasn't there. He was in Germany. And then when he came back from Germany, he was in a uh, in a better mood. And I was like, okay, well, let's start shooting again. And then that's the last time I saw him. And what happened? So they found his body September, maybe September 2016. A reported suicide. Yeah, he, he took his life. That's what happened. The last time I saw him, though, he was in a great mood. He told me he was ready to start a whole he said he said he had found this new technique in germany and he was going to start producing all this work and um i was like cool you know I, I was just shooting him over time so i was never pressing him to like you know it didn't it wasn't going to be like this this documentary like like it is now it was going to be just over time and you know sometimes he would call me his phone number would be different then i wouldn't see him for you know two or three weeks and then I'd get a call from some strange number and it would be him. And so, yeah, so it, it was just chopped up on the times that I was shooting him. And, you know, I wish I had more time with him, but that's when I just started piecing together stuff from, from other people. After he passed, I put it down for a little while, the, the documentary, because I, first of all, I was just, I was devastated. You know, it wasn't in my mind that I was going to do a documentary. So I literally just woke up one day and was like, man, this, this guy's story is just so interesting. And, you know, he had a message and he had, you know, he had a purpose. He wanted to get his stuff out there. So I just literally woke up one day and called his friend and was like, hey, do you mind if I just come and interview you about nobody? And she was like, sure. And then I just started contacting people. I was like, let me just start gathering interviews and just talking about people's reaction to him, how he influenced them, how he made them mad, (laughs) how he made them laugh, how he inspired them. 
And it just kept going on from there. And every time I interviewed them, they'd be like, hey, have you talked to such and such? Mm. Or have you touched, talk, you should touch to such and such because they were really good friends. Or you should talk to such and such because they used to date or they used to hang out. So it just, people just, it just started picking up from there. And then the word kind of spread, like just in the Winwood community, like this, there's this guy doing a documentary on, on TMNK. And so it got a little easier because I, I do remember the first calls that I would make. One of the first calls that I made to somebody that I didn't know is this girl, Jenny Perez, who's an artist, a great, incredible artist. And I was telling her what I was doing. And she was just dead silent. Just as I was like, hello, hello. She was just like, yeah, you know, I, I'm going to have to call you back. And so I was like, all right, cool. So she called me back. She was like, listen, and you know, the, you know, you calling me just kind of messed me up because I hadn't talked about him and it hurt. his passing really hurt me. So you calling me like that out the blue is just really affected me. So, I, you know, so after that, we started talking more and I, I did an interview with her and then she was instrumental in um, helping me capture a couple other artists as well. So it just snowballed from there. About how many hours of footage of interview footage did you have? of TMNK and how much uh, B-roll footage did you have like just hours wise or terabytes or what have you so hours of him that I actually filmed I probably have two or three hours and again I could have more but again he would disappear we would stop filming is that like interview or is that B-roll it's B-roll and interview okay. between the two B-roll and interview again it went from being the short to right. now with the pursuits of being a feature which is a whole different animal Right. <laughs> like this. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's a whole be, different you know, thing. Yeah. Yeah. And it's just not when you're doing a feature too, it has to be um it can't just be a bunch of talking heads. That's when they become boring and you zone out. Yeah, it has to have like some arc and some change and some compelling stories. Yeah, and and, and a little bit of structure to it as well. So when you see the film as well, I tried to map a lot of the topics that I was talking about with the art. So you can see the correlation mm -hmm. with what he's talking about or what somebody else is talking about with, with the actual art. So that takes time to put together. What were some helpful resources that helped you along in creating the structure and learning the formatting of making a feature film? Were there any books or any films or any techniques that you used that go, you know, I never thought about that because it is, it's a very strong film and you, you clearly understand the structure. Well, I mean, that you saw the final iteration. There's like 20 different, <laughs> 20, there's like 20, 25 different edits. Okay, perfect. And I, and I just saw this interview with Martin Scorsese. He was saying, if your first rough cut doesn't make you want to throw up, there's something <laughs> wrong. Yeah, I saw that. That was Masterclass. Yeah, Masterclass. Yeah, and I was like, yeah. I, was like I know that exactly was what you're talking about, Martin. That was Martin. helpful when he said that because I've been working on some things and I was like, this is shit. This is this yeah. is bullshit. And then I would right. walk off. And then when he said that, I was like, oh, that's that's the process? Oh, yeah. okay. And so, you know, I have hard drives literally called false starts of just like right. this didn't even make it to the tenth minute or whatever. But well, what helped me with that was, you know, I went I went to Howard University and we used to have to do all these projects, right? Okay, got you. You know, I, I was a radio television film major, so but my my concentration was more uh was radio more, but they didn't have like a sound, sound like class for sound. So all these filmmakers, but I, I knew how to work sound. I knew how to do, I was really into music and I was a DJ. So I was helping a lot of these filmmakers, you know, put with their sound for the films because their films were just, were, you know, it was absent. Just simple stuff like somebody closes the door. You need to put a, a close oh, the door yeah. sound like, on there. Uh, Foley sound you know, effects. Foley, yeah, yeah, all Foley sound effects. Just little stuff that really helps your film be real. Because I was watching these some of these films and I'm like, man, they, there's no sound there. There's, they need to put that there. And so yeah. I helped some of them do that. But plus I was doing all these audio projects and I think they were like, oh, this is great. And then I come back the next day, I was like, who the fuck recorded this? This shit sounds horrible. <laughs> <laughs> and so I learned that process early on in college that, okay, you think it's great the first time, but if you go home, give yourself a rest. Yeah, fresh eyes you, is everything. Fresh eyes, fresh ears, you come back and you're like, okay, now nah, this needs to change. You know, and like you said, that's the process. So after doing all these edits and things like that, you know, I was just like, man, this is th this is coming together. This is coming together like I like it. So Was there ever a point when you were like showing people the film and someone said something that made you go back to the drawing board. You was like, oh, or like a punch in the stomach. No, there was one. There's one woman uh, that I that I sent it, 
So when you do some some things like this, they it's not a rough cut. It's like they call it an assemblage okay. where you just kind of put the pieces together. And what she sh- said to me was, "Oh, this seems like two different stories that you're doing." But I knew I knew what she was talking about, but I also knew that she didn't get what I was trying to do. Okay. Because um sometimes and especially artist stories they try to just separate it like this artist is just this one person and he's out there just doing it by himself. But there's, you know, there's family involved and how they react and how they feel. And I've watched a lot of art films and they're, they're really, I, I can't say that there's an art film that I had seen that had a lot of the family's perspective on what the artist was doing and how it was affecting them as a family. Mm. So I knew she didn't know what I was trying to do. Um, so that, and, but, so I, I have faith in my vision. So, and that's another thing. Sometimes people give you criticism and you can either, you know, take that criticism and make it work for you or you stick to your guns and you know what your vision is. And then you show them, then when you start the final project, because then nobody else is in your head, you mm-hmm. know what I mean? You can't, sometimes you present stuff to people and you expect them to see what's the final version that's in your head, but they can't do that. All they can see is what you put in front of them. Yes. So so that's what really made me work harder on it and put it together. And showing somebody that something that's incomplete, they can say something unknowingly discouraging, but it's your fault because you gave them right. the unfinished piece for them to say whatever the hell they were going to say about it. So it's right. kind of a slippery slope when you're trying to get fresh eyes and perspective to say at least go you know what where you got i have a, a, a like one of a good friend like a, a brother his name is steve and over right. time like steve and i would show each other projects and there was a project i was working on recently he just like watching he was like i'm I'm glad you got it like and then you know mm-hmm. over time we would talk about it as i got further but he mastered the art of like even if he felt some things that it wasn't ready to say those things until you got to your final vision as what you were just saying Exactly. You want stuff to bounce off the opinions of other people. You know, try to make sure it's people that are doing have done the same thing. Don't try to do it to somebody who has no idea. Oh no man, I've made that mistake. Ask somebody who who knows nothing about who doesn't even watch Vimeo videos or don't watch anything. You're like, so what do you think? And they're like, you know what? And they go someplace and you're like, oh my god, like you're not right. even. You have no reference to even the art of film. Or even exactly. art in general, and I'm asking you what you think, and I'm exactly the things that you're saying are just really abrasive. I made I've made that mistake too. That's a good one. Yeah, you make sure you you show it to somebody that's in that realm, whatever you're doing. Yeah, that's in in the same realm, not somebody who's foreign to whatever you're doing. Let me ask you a trick question: If nobody, if TMNK saw your film, if you had a guess, like what do you think he would say about the film you made about him? I think he would say it's honest. And I, I remember talking to somebody that he was close to. And um, I think this is, he was kind of saying, he kind of, you know, he kind of made his rounds to everybody when saying goodbye to people through emails, through call, phone conversations. And he told her, he was like, just tell the truth. Just tell the truth. And the truth sometimes is is the ugly along with the pretty. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yes. That's what life is, man. It's, it's pretty, it's ugly, it's bumpy. But at the end of it, if you can live with it and your truth and you're honest with yourself, no matter all the ugly shit you had to go through, then, you know, it's sometimes just worth it. I think he would say it's honest. I think he would like it. I think, he's, he, I think some of it, too, he would not... Because he was very secretive about parts of his life. That's the first thing that I noticed when I watched the film. I was like, holy shit, this, he's really in the film. Because when you were yeah. watching, when when I first got wind of you making this film, I was like, I don't know anything. I know him, but I don't know him. I'm cool right. with him. and I'm mad cool, but I don't, I don't really know much. Everything was just a mystery. Everyone he ever encountered was on a need to know basis. Like you could have, right. you could have this bit of me, you could have this bit of me, you could do this. And a lot of what he was doing was so mysterious. So even as I'm watching your doc, I'm like, so is this like an actor or something? Like, is this somebody like <laughs> someone else walking in these frames? Like it was just mind blowing to me that someone had ca- like, oh shit, someone actually has his voice, his demeanor, his sense of humor, even the poetry. It's such a rich experience to kind of like, all right, let's go behind the curtain to see what the mystery really is. Yeah, and he had traveled around to different 
different places too. So he was different people to different people in different places. And still all him, I will say that like authentically him, but everybody knew a different part of who he was. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or, or, or a different stage of who he was and who he was becoming in different names, uh, different States, different countries, <laughs> people. Cause I still get, people who send me DMs about, you know, say they'll they'll say a different name. I knew Dre, I knew TMK, I knew Scott. You know, they'll tell they'll tell me different names. So when they do that, I know, you know, where he was and at what period when they say and they mention him by that particular name. Yeah. So it's really interesting that that uh those conversations with other people who knew him. And it was good that you put that in there. Like certain people knew him as this and certain like, right. what was the first name he wanted to be called? Uh, well, the first one I got wind of was, was Ska. 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 S-K-A. Yeah. yeah. Like the music. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So yeah. to go from Scott to Ska, it was almost like pretty much the same name, but different. Totally different. Yeah. Right. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So that's the interesting thing about people who see it, because there's people in Cali who are going to know that part of him. You know, that part of him, I really didn't. That that was the early part. So I didn't really get too much of the Cali. The more the um, the meat was in uh, the New York side of it. So talk about your New York experience, like how sharing or giving were New York artists and assisting you and making the film or showing up for the interviews, that kind of thing. They were super excited to to know that you know, somebody was continuing the story. So the first, one of the first ones I contact was AV1, who actually is the one who got him started, um, wow. you know, helping him do street art, street art. He was, in fact, he said to me, he was like, man, I always thought about doing a documentary about this guy because his life was so interesting. So when I called everybody, everybody was on board. There was maybe one person who really wasn't on board. You know, there was some bad blood between people, between crews. He was down to do it, but he really wasn't down to do it because every time I called, he'd come up missing. And then after I stopped filming, filming he'd be like, oh man, I'm sorry, I missed it. But, but right. for the most part, you know, everybody was super accommodating. You know, I, I came up, I called everybody, you know, you were there. I said, look, I got, you know, one night, in ten, well, actually I, I shot two nights in uh, New York. So I, I had limited time. So that's why I had to have everybody in one place. We all showed up, was that in Brooklyn? In Brooklyn, yeah. And uh, was that like in 2020 or 2021? No, dude, that was before that. That was, um, shit, I want to say 2018, 2019. That was 2019? It was, it, was, it was before the pandemic. For real? Oh, my yeah. God, damn. Yeah, yeah, I want to say that was 2018. Wow. 2018, 2019, yeah. I know time goes quick. Time goes too quick. Because in my mind, like, I thought that happened in the middle of the pandemic. No, okay, no, that it makes happened so much before. Sense. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, it happened before the pandemic. So, I, you know, nobody was wearing masks. You know, we were no. all just free floating. Yeah. I was on a plane going up to New York. So that was before the pandemic. And that's another thing when people see a project that we were talking about earlier, uh, oh man, this is going to take forever. Nah, and they just don't want to do it. But if you just keep doing it, time is going to fly by and you're going right. to be like, oh shit, I completed a project. When I started seeing that you had completed it, I was extremely happy for you because I know that sometimes life happens, things happen, budgets happen, who knows what. And then all of a sudden things don't seem seen all the way to the end. And so I was very excited to see it, but I wasn't going to like bug you. I was just like, the time will come, the time will come. And so when I finally saw it, I was like, oh, my God, he did it. Like, you you, you put everything in its right place. I didn't feel like it was too short or too long. I felt like I got everything that I ever wanted to know about TMNK that I probably wouldn't even have asked him if I, you know, if I was ever kicking it with him. You know, I just would have been absorbing whatever the hell he would have been doing at the time. What was your reaction when I when I contacted you? I, honestly, it was just like, it, this should be done. And that's why I was like, yo, yeah, whatever, however I can help. And I had footage, so I was like, I've got footage. I don't want anything for it. I don't want to like do business. I want you to, I want to assist in contributing to the story. It makes things harder when people bring business into art and right. I wasn't hurting for bread and I didn't, it wasn't going to benefit by trying to like put you in a corner and be like, yo, this is my fight. It just is, I didn't want to do none of that. I just wanted to right. say, you're doing a story on TMNK. Well, I have this. And if you so choose to utilize it, then so be it, you know, and you did you did right by it. At one point, I interviewed TMNK at Scope years ago, 
and he gave me this like super prolific interview and I published it. And then I, when he passed away, I did a dedication podcast. Mm -hmm. I just used the audio or what have you. And then when I found out about what you were doing, I was like, here's another life for it, for more of an audience, for more people to see it. And so right. I, I just wanted to assist in any way, you know, even as we stand here and do what we're doing right now, we're just like, we're keeping his name alive, his energy alive. And so I, I'm just honored to be a part of it in any capacity. Well, that's, I mean, that just shows you how kismic it is because I always was wondering too, is like, there's some stuff that I wanted to fill in and you were generous enough to be like, hey, I got this footage and I went through it. And it came together like a puzzle. Like mm. I was just like, oh man, this is perfect. Cause you know, I had all, I had a lot of the different pieces, but I was like, I'm missing this. And I did contemplate um, getting somebody to do reenactments and doing an actor and all that. But I was just like, no, nah, I don't think that, I don't think that'll work. And then you came up with, with you, what you had. And I was like, man, this is, this is, this is Dustin. This is Dustin, you know, for this to come in here and fit in perfectly. Mm. Um, to some of the pieces that I was missing. Uh, and not only that, there was another guy, his name is Pascal. He had a um, he had an art uh, magazine called Talking Off the Wall. And he did the same thing. He, he was like, listen, I have this footage that I shot of TMNK. I didn't know what to do with it. I never published it. And I have no idea. He was like, you can use it if you want. And that just kept happening. Every Again, every every time somebody heard I was doing it or I did an interview, they'd be like, look, I got this, I got this piece of him from somewhere or somebody would send me something via Facebook or Instagram yeah. and email it to me. So that's the pieces that started to come together. And as a documentary filmmaker, that's what you need. You got to do it. And I, I don't have I a imagine. research team. Yeah, so stuff like that just started happening, which I knew he was, you know, his hand was pushing me along this I, whole time. I 100% believe that. And I feel yeah. and, and I feel like just in the way that I personally live my life, like, yeah, I do business and I do, and I do, but some things ain't, you could feel it in your soul, like, yo, mm -hmm. put the money or put the lotion in the basket. Like, it's just, right, right. <laughs> that's probably a right. bad analogy. But sometimes, just like, <laughs> pause. <laughs> just pause. Yeah, just, <laughs> but sometimes you just have to, like, do your part and doing your part is creating the least amount of resistance and assisting someone getting to their goal. And that's it. And I totally appreciate it. I mean, the film would not be the same without what you have, what you gave me. The film would not be the same without what Pascal gave me. Mm -hmm. The film would not be the same with like just the small pieces that I got from him in New York, from people who were there and, and sending me like just, just clips of them on the street. You know, it's just, in fact, to be honest with you, somebody, somebody told me, he was like, listen, I was a young filmmaker when I was 16. I was running around the streets of Soho and I tried to do a documentary on uh, the guys out and I have a bunch of footage. I have an old hard drive. He was like, you can have it if you want. And I was like, that. And he sent it to me and I couldn't retrieve anything. So I had to go to, you know, the people who retrieve stuff from hard disk and, you know, retrieve yeah. files and stuff. And I spent $900 on trying to retrieve that stuff. Nothing was there. Nothing could be retrieved. Wow. So I was like, yeah, exactly. But that was my commitment to it because I was like, if I get this old footage from them sitting down in Soho, this will be great. Right, right, right. But, um, you know, it didn't happen. But again, at, when stuff like that happens, you can't be discouraged. You just got to find a workaround. But I mean, you still got it, though. Like, I saw the yeah. footage of him like, yo, this is my spot. You got to kick rocks. Like, yeah, I yeah. And to, that's, I got to yeah. see it, you know. Yeah. And again, that's somebody sending like, look, I got this in my phone from, you know, 07 that, I, you know, it's an old phone. I don't know if you can use it or not, but I'm going to give it to you. So I found a way to use it. Was that something that you had to like up res or do anything special to take old footage or it just, it just, that's the aesthetic. That, I mean, that's what it looked like. I mean, you know, I, I couldn't it, even it, tell, like it just looked like VHS digital footage, I guess. But the story well, was, still you know, it's an old on. iPhone. Yeah, yeah. It's from an old iPhone. And, you know, you do, you know, post-production and you have, you know, you try to boost up the colors and stuff like that, but it's still going to look like a shot with the old iPhone camera, which it was. Yeah. So, but again, it gives you that feel, that, that feel of what that it was, was what it when looked people like. recorded. Exactly. That's what 2007 looked like. Damn. Wow. What has been one of the biggest challenges that you've encountered uh, with this film? 
money. Okay. <laughs> just like it is. Money's always the biggest uh, challenge in, in any, especially film project. The, the gift and the curse right now is that, you know, I can distribute myself because everybody's, well, when's it going to be on Netflix? When's it going to be on Prime? When's it going to, it doesn't actually work like that. How it works now is it's, you know, movies are going the way, the, the same way the music industry went. The middleman is, is, was always the record label. I'm sorry. The the distribution was always the the middleman that you had to you had to go through for people to hear or see your stuff. Mm-hmm. Now you can distribute it yourself. With that being said, the curse of that is there's a bunch of stuff out there as well. So you have to be your own publicity. You have to be your own marketing to make your stuff stand out and to make people want to watch it. Because if not, you just have something up on the channel that nobody's going to watch. And there was a time when Netflix and Amazon were just buying up everything just in case it hit. Not that they thought believed in it or anything like that. They just, just in case it hit, they wanted to have it. And then your stuff is buried and nobody sees it. Right. And that's what I don't want to happen. That's why I'm doing these interviews. That's why I'm doing these screenings. That's why I'm going around the country. I want to take my... That's the thing with filmmakers. They want to rush the process. Mm. I want I want this shit out yesterday. I want this shit out last year. But it doesn't matter if I put it out and nobody sees it. So that's why I'm taking my time. You know, doing the film is one thing. Post-production is another thing. Now I'm fully engaged in the marketing and publicity. And as an indie filmmaker, you have to be more than creative. Now you're the business. Now you're the you're Paramount. Now you're whatever company is. Now you're Sony. You're the person that has to make sure that you put it out and market it and promote it or else nobody's going to see what you've been working on for years. And that's a shame. What's something that you've learned from nobody to find that workaround. That's what he always did. This is a guy who people said, oh, you can't do this. You can't do that. You're not going to be a successful street artist. There's no way you can do that. Somebody close to me actually told me they didn't believe in me. And that that hurt me, but it also motivated me. Mm. And then whenever I wanted to stop, or whenever I got a roadblock, I, in my head, I promise you, I'd always be like, damn, well, what would nobody do? And I'd like, he'd keep fucking going. He'd find a way. And that's what I did. So through this whole thing, this whole project is just him channeling himself through me. And I think I, I told you before, I feel possessed by this. Mm. I kind of, I want to be done with it <laughs> because I'm like, I'm every day um, living, breathing to get this man's message out and for everybody to see his artwork because I thought he was that brilliant. One of the biggest messages I ever got from TMNK was, I am not defined by your ignorance. Mm. To me, that was just hard hitting. And I remember the first time I saw it, I was walking. I, I was definitely in the Lower East Side, and it was written on the on the ground. Mm-hmm. And I knew it was him, like because he loved to write on the ground. What are some of the statements that came up? Some of these like TMNK statements. Some of the pros, yeah, like uh, you know, play on words, like nobody cares. You know, that'd be a big thing, like. He, he would put like a dollar on the floor or something like that and put a piece of glass on top of it and right over top, nobody cares and put about about the homeless, which meant that, you know, like I said, the play on words with like nobody cares, but his name is nobody. He cares. So he cares. He's the one that cares. Yeah. 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 He's the one who cares. Uh, Love Story Sucks was a big one for him. Art is My Weapon was was a big thing for him as well. You know, there's so much going on in the world right now. This is when I really start to miss him because every time something happens, I'd be like, man, I wonder what he would be writing right now in response to whatever's going on in the world right now. What were some of the things? Because I know one of the things that like, even in the interview that I did with him all those years ago, there was that comparison to Basquiat. And you didn't yeah. really go, you didn't even go there really in the film. The interesting thing is he and Basquiat are, uh, I think maybe six months apart in age. Mm. The difference is he didn't even start until so he didn't even start really pursuing and doing his art until nobody. He didn't, he didn't start pursuing his art until he was 46 years old. Basquiat started much younger. Mm-hmm. But if you look at his work, he didn't want to be Basquiat. He wanted to be Picasso. If you really look at his work, he wanted to be Picasso. Mm. If you look at the, if you really look at his art, you talking about nobody wanted to be Picasso. Or nobody, Basquiat? nobody wanted to be Picasso. Okay, break it down. He named it. He named his dog Picasso. Okay. If you see the the styles and you look at the styles that Picasso did and the styles that nobody did, you will see the similarities. And now that I put that in your head, when you look at the artwork, you be like, holy shit! This is 
This is Picasso. So it has that Cubist feel to it? Exactly, exactly. And I think the thing that throws people off with the Basquiat reference is the crown. Well, he would say he would say he would say Basquiat doesn't own the crown. There's a new film about Basquiat, and it's it's, it's more about his travel. He did a show in Africa, mm-hmm. right? But when he went to Africa, they were like, "Oh, there's this big artist from Africa. I mean, from America coming to Africa." And then you know the elites in Africa that saw his stuff weren't really impressed. But there was a um, section of artists that were doing something similar. They called it Vuvu. So the Vuvu artists, um, they didn't have supplies. They didn't have a lot of stuff to make. So their teacher taught them, he said, use whatever you can find. So they use fish scales and monkey fur and stuff like that. And their stuff is similar. So when they came and saw Basquiat, they were like, oh, he's just like us. Mm. So there's these two different sets of artists living in two different continents but you know Basquiat has that you know nucleus of Africa in him Mm -hmm. and he was doing the same style of art that they were doing in Africa you know oftentimes you find one black artist and then then that's the one they focus on same with actors same with saying like if one there's gonna gonna be one black actor of a generation you know they don't give a bunch of people same with Basquiat they just give it all to Basquiat and there's a bunch of people out there but once you see that there's so many different people out there, you'll see the differences in the artwork. And that's what this film will, and as well, you know, once you start seeing the stories and hearing the stories, then you can really start seeing the difference. So that's one of my goals is to do this installation as a film, but also have his artwork. I want people to see his artwork before the film. And then I want to get their reaction when they come out the film and see the artwork. Because it's going to give them some insight into the artwork and they can see where the happiness is. They can see where the pain is. They can see where the turmoil is. They can mm-hmm. see where the joy is. It's so what's Exactly. And you sometimes you have to do that. At other times, you leave it totally up, you know, they put it up there and it's totally up to what you interpret. I have a really good friend. His name is Juan. When I got that tribute, that tribute episode, the podcast episode, when TMNK mm-hmm. passed, shortly after that, maybe days he discovered a TMNK in his building by the trash. And he was just like, what the hell is this? He was like, this looks familiar. I don't know what it is. And then he took it into the house and he was like, oh, I think that this is a TMNK because it wasn't like, I don't think he like signed it, but it was clearly a TMNK when he showed me the picture. But it was like the same day he had heard that the tribute episode. Right. Um, can you talk about those like magical moments that people would tell you about various things or one time when I was in Montreal, someone wrote in his hand style, Amon. And I was mm-hmm. like, was that you? And he was like, ha ha, nobody's everywhere or some something mystical or what right. have you. So can you tell a few of those stories? Yeah, I mean, there's there's a guy in the interview, um, in, a, in the movie that I interviewed. And um, before I interviewed him, he was like, listen, man, I have to tell you something. When you called me, it was a little trippy because um, I came... I came to his studio, he came to his studio and somebody had just put this artwork down. He didn't know who it was. It wasn't a sign. And it just said nobody. It was a figure and it said nobody and it had wings on it. Um, I was like, did anybody tell you? He was like, nobody has, no one has told me where this art or they gifted me this. It just showed up on my, on my, in my studio the day you called me. There was another one where, you know, like I said, when I, when I called Jenny Perez, I, I called her out of the blue and she was like, I, I was just thinking about him and I had not thought about him in a long time. And that's why she was completely silent because it freaked her out that I called her and she was <laughs> thinking about him. And she was, I mean, it was dead silent when I was like, hello, hello, are you there? She was like, yeah, yeah, I'm here, but I'm going to have to call you back. And so she had to go through like her whole process of like, man, why did this happen? And I was just thinking about this man and I hadn't thought about it in a long time. So it's just, and also just the way things have come together with this film where I was just like, I don't know how I'm going to do this. I didn't know how I was going to go to New York and film this. I just put it out there in the world and hope that the art community will help me out. And that's what happened. Mm. A guy called me from the West Coast and was like, look, I got to be in New York you know, I do film. I, I knew nobody. I like what you're doing. I'm going to come over there and help you film it. And then I will call you and I call a bunch of artists and say, hey, I know, I know you guys don't know me from Adam, but I'm doing this this documentary. Will you come in and 
do sit for an interview and everybody it was a resounding yes from everybody yeah i didn't even think uh, twice i was like where what time as long as i'm in town i'll be there like as long right. as, as I, that's it i didn't even think about like whether it was going to be good bad ugly i didn't care i was like where are you you going to put your i'm with it and i just showed up like today i got off a phone call from the newark museum a conference call i didn't know how because i you know my thing was i always wanted to bring it back to, to newark so i had a great conversation with them um, and that's just putting it out to his mentee. I was like, I don't know how we're going to do this, but we got a show in Newark somehow, some way. Um, when I did the show at Panther Coffee in Wynwood, I just said, I want to do this film. I had no no idea how I was going to do it, how I was going to finance the screening because it was at an empty lot. Uh, it was noisy. I got headphones. I got an LED wall screen. Wow. I needed the space. It, you know, it, it's probably a budget like six six K and I, I, didn't, I didn't have six K. So <laughs> I didn't know how I was going to do it. But then, you know, I started talking to people, started getting donations, people helping me out there and kind donations. And everybody loved it. Same thing with when in New York. When I'll be in New York June 8th. Uh, I didn't know how I was going to screen that. And Don Collins, the Maisel Center for Documentary Film, said they'd love to screen it. So it's just, you know, I, like I said, I always feel like it's just his hand pushing me along this whole time. For this whole project. Yeah. And it's just, it's all going to come together. And, you know, my whole goal is to make people aware of his story and his art, because there's a lot of stuff that he's given people from all over the world. And, you know, some people have traveled from Miami, from New York. And, you know, sometimes he gave them stuff. Sometimes, you know, he sold them stuff. There's stuff on eBay that people bought. A lot of but collaborations. Them, a lot of collaborations out there. And I want people to know that this stuff is valuable. To people, It personally, I, I, I've had conversations with people like it means a lot to me. But sometimes just the average person, he would literally just walk up, do a little drawing on a little piece of cardboard and give it to him and say, nobody loves you. And they'd be like, what are you talking about? I'm like, no, no, no. My name is nobody and I love you. I just wanted to give you this piece. <laughs> so they may have gone home and just put it in their closet and didn't think about it, but didn't know the importance, didn't know his story. So now it's going to have a whole different meaning. And I want people to come out with that art and cherish it and, and know how important it is. So the last question is the question I ask everybody who's ever appeared on the show. I've noticed like the people who don't answer this question, I never actually published the episode. <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> <That's a precious laughs> no i'm joking what has been the biggest lesson you've learned so far from this experience oh man i, I you know i cry a thousand tears um because this is my friend too so i gotta sit here and watch it and um but I, what, what i've learned is um and I, I tell people this is kind of a cautionary tale as well um there's passion and then there's unbridled passion where it's just out of control. You don't know how to bottle it. It just, it's everywhere. Um, and I know people like that. It's just, they're just out of control with it. It's just, I, I, I like it to, um, you know, when you spray a spray can and then the mist comes and just hits you in the face and it's not, you know, you got to hold it close to the wall. If you hold it, if you, if it's not close to the wall, the spray is going to go everywhere. Mm -hmm. And, and that's, that's the thing you don't want. You know, it's coming out, there's paint coming out and it could land somewhere and maybe cre be creative. But if you just focus that passion and put that spray can, spray can right on the wall, you're going to get what you want. You know what I mean? You're going to control that passion. You're going to be able to put it on there and control it and make sure it's what you want. So what I've learned is about this process is I could want this to be the biggest movie I ever, this is going to be great. I can talk about it. I can be like, this is what I want. And that's how I was at first. I was like, oh my God, you gotta, we got to do this film. And then but I had to slow myself down and be like, okay, you want to do this, um, but you have to do it right. And you have to make sure that your passion is focused, laser focused on what you want to produce and what you want people to see and what you want people to hear in this particular message. So I put my spray can close as I could to that wall so I could make that perfect piece, man. So that's what I've learned. Keep the can close to the wall. Fantastic. That's it. That's how we're going to end it. Rico. Perfect. Thank you so much for no, taking the brother, time out thank you. to uh, kick it with us, to, um, you know, thank you for making this film and filling in the voids and filling in the blanks of the questions that I even had, you know, and thank you for just doing a great job. So, I mean, like, 
Um, you too, brother. Thank you for supplying me with this uh, this footage and you know showing up for the interview and and doing the interview and taking my calls, man. I appreciate it. Now, yeah, you know how we do, man. It takes a village, like <laughs> all day, all day. So um, we're out of here. It's been real. Yeah, man. See you I'll next see you time. June eighth. June eighth. Yeah, in Harlem. I'm excited about that. That documentary house has been making waves recently. To see that your film is playing there, I was like, oh shit, so I guess I'm supposed to be there. <laughs> exactly. exactly. So it's a go. Rico, man, have a great day. I'll speak to you soon. All right, brother. Thank All right, you, brother. Man. Peace. Peace.